Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello Walter. Hi Martin. Are you doing well? Yes. Trials when seen as educators will produce joy. Beautiful statement. <laughs> Yo, with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you promised us trials. And you also said that Jesus went through all of it. So why not we? We ask that you help us through these trials and that you also bless this discussion and help the viewers to enlighten their minds with the Holy Spirit that all of us can see the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Martin, we're going to talk about the greatest commandment today. And uh, why are we talking about the greatest commandment? Because you remember that we did a WhatsApp prof where we also discussed the Roe versus Wade issue. And there were some people that misinterpreted what we have said, and some of them were quite vociferous to the point of calling us liars and all kinds of strange things. So it is uh, with that in mind that we wanted to clarify why our ministry has a certain angle and does not necessarily conform to the angles of other ministries. That's true, because we have a mission. Yeah, so it is it, the direction that you take is determined by many, many factors. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, I've come to the conclusion that if we concentrate on the three angels' messages, then we are addressing the heart of the matter. And if you really look at it, you encompass all the other, everything, in any case. Everything. So... The greatest commandment, we all know what the greatest commandment is. Jesus defined it for us very well, and it's very often stated in the Old Testament. But let's just first go to that other discussion and see what we can learn from it. Mm. Now, it has come to our attention that there are these thoughts going around because of the way in which we present it. Mm -hmm. the issue on abortion, that some people actually believe, quite erroneously, of course, that we are pro-abortion, or at least I am. Well, it's, they misinterpreted a lot of what we said, or a lack of what we said. Yes, they don't, they don't read between the lines what we are saying. So maybe we must spell some things out so that it becomes clear. This is not in any way an attack on those that uh, yeah. had these ideas. It's, let's call it a clarification. That's it, because there's also been a few people that misinterpreted when we were actually discussing um, offshoots. Yes. They also took it upon themselves that we were talking about them. So maybe we must just clarify some of what we mean because mm -hmm. I think we have a, a, a big viewership that understand what we're talking about. Yes. But to clarify for the others. Yeah, and some are new to the faith, so how, how is it possible even for them to, you know, to grasp all the nuances of what we are saying? So we have to be, we have to be perhaps a little bit more uh, careful in how we say things and explain a little more. When we talk about offshoots, we're talking about groups that call people out of the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are not talking about people inside that are upset with issues within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm. Now, are there issues that we or I personally would be upset about? Yes. Many. Many. <laughs> Many. <laughs> the list is endless. And we've had quite a few discussions on it as well. We mentioned them, but we don't go into details. We don't mention names, and we don't go into assassination principles. But uh, 
we concentrate on the three angels' messages, and we have to make quite clear why. Exactly. And why this impacts how you deal with other issues. It's very important that people understand that. Because we always state you must not get involved in the politics. Don't choose a side. Don't choose a side. Don't go left. Don't go right. Be an observer. Be an observer. That doesn't mean that you don't observe things on the left or observe things on the right with which you vehemently disagree. Exactly. But to start making those things the issue, you're starting to make it a political issue. And the same... Or a moral issue, a particular that, one. That's where it comes to, because now when some things are morally uh, inclined, people choose a side, and then the same happens in the political sphere. Yes, and uh, you know, some people feel very strongly about some issues, others feel uh, less strongly about it, some feel there are exceptions to a rule, some feel there are no exceptions to a rule. We don't go into those issues at all. We concentrate on the three angels' messages, and we have to make quite clear why. Exactly. So, you know, I have no beef with people that find a particular activity or some issue highly offensive and will have a tirade about it and say why they feel like this. But they often feel that everybody else must climb onto their soapbox as well mm -hmm. and join them. And we have consistently refused to do that. Exactly. We stay on this three angels' messages wall. We'll mention these things. Exactly. That's what I wanted to just emphasize again. These things will be implemented in, on the wall. Yes. It, it, is covered by what the wall message has to say. Yes. But it's not a soapbox message only. Correct. Now, if you take the three angels' message, if you take the first angels' message, it starts with worship God mm. and give fear God and give him the glory yeah. for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made mm -hmm. the heavens, the earth, the sea, the springs of water. That's a very important message. So the first angel's message starts with God. Mm -hmm. And the, who the true God is and who, to whom the authority belongs. Correct. The second one and the third one are addendums mm -hmm. to the first. They are expansions of uh, the acceptance of the authority of God. Now, when we look at humanity and we see how humanity acts, there is no doubt that God is not only misrepresented in the world, God is misunderstood in the world, but there is absolute defiance on so many levels against the authority of God. And let's call sin by its right name. Sin leads to death. Mm. Now, Martin... I can take any particular sin and make it my pet hate. Yeah. And I can lecture about that sin. I can talk about it. And I want everybody in the world to understand that this sin is so gross to me that everybody should join me in my particular attack on dealing with this issue. Is that right? That is exactly what happens because that's, again, as we've mentioned before, you choosing a side, or you getting pulled into the whole thing. Okay, now there's another person perhaps who has another son that he's pet hate. And he gets highly upset if you, uh, you, you are not on his soapbox as well. Mm -hmm. So how many soapboxes must we climb onto in order to deal with all the sins of humanity? Actually, not one. Aha. Uh -huh. Actually, not one. But I have no beef. No. If people feel strongly about certain issues. And uh, in actual fact, I would support it because people need to know what sin is. So let's just make that quite clear. But we're going to go to the greatest commandment. But before we do that, let's just look at some of the comments that have come through 
as a result of that last one and see how people think about it. Now, before we get there, let's just answer the question why we concentrate on the three angels' messages. So this is our backdrop, right? Mm -hmm. This is where our starting point. Yeah, this is the crux of the matter. Yes. Whenever, if you keep to this, you won't get swallowed in, and then you'll also always see the bigger picture. And yeah. that's what we always want to put the big picture, put the puzzle together in, according to prophecy. Yes. Now, everybody knows these quotes, but we today want to discuss why these quotes are so important. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Now, we've had this quote on the screen numerous times. But Martin, what does it mean? You are allowed to have nothing else absorb your attention. Don't. Get this must be your focus. That's it. Now, you, there are many, many roads that lead to the three angels' messages. And there are many issues that you can attach to it. But the heart of the issue should be your focus. Mm -hmm. There's another quote from early writings. I saw a company who stood well guarded and firm, giving no countenance to those who would unsettle the established faith of the body. That's quite an interesting statement. When it talks about the body, it's obviously talking about the church. The church. Right? God looked upon them with approbation. I was shown three steps, the first, second, and third angel's messages, said my accompanying angel, Woe to him who shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. I don't think many people realize how vitally important they are. Mm. It's a matter of life and death. The destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which they are received. I was again brought down through these messages and saw how dearly the people of God had purchased their experience. It had been obtained through much suffering and severe conflict. God had led them along step by step until he had placed them upon a solid, immovable platform. Martin, that's where I want to be. Exactly. That is the platform you have to stand on. That is the platform I stand upon. That doesn't negate other platforms, no. but this is the one that we have chosen. So, Martin, we've, we have received some comments about that last lecture on Roe versus Wade and all of those things. And let's have a look how some people interpreted it. Now, this is not an attack on them. No, that, This is how they saw it. So, obviously, we need to do some clarification. And we have to address it. Yes. A terrible overreach. SDA pioneers who are mocked and ignored were as clear about abortion, which they called child murder, as they were about slavery. Both were heinous crimes against humanity, and abortion is a very racist crime. The overturning of Roe versus Wade is not the joining of church and state. What is he thinking? Tunnel vision. Turning the legality of abortion over to the states was a common sense move. The first four commandments are our duty to God. The last six are our duty to man. Because of sin, the civil government has had to step in when one of the last six commandments are violated. The state has no say in the first four commandments and our duty to God. That would be a violation of our liberty of conscience. It is not a matter of conscience to decide whether you commit murder or not. That is a crime. They do have a say when murder is committed. Pay attention, folks. No one is infallible. Now, Martin, there are a number of interesting things regarding this comment. Number one, the person feels very strongly about abortion. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I or you or we don't feel strongly about it as well, exactly. right? That's the first issue. Maybe we must clarify we will. Okay. 
We will clarify. The other issue is, it is stated here that abortion is a racist crime. Now, that is probably because of constant propaganda by the media that this notion has crept through. You see, so this is firstly when you get sucked in politically. Yes. Now, it might be so that there might be people who have racist agendas yeah. when it comes to abortion. But uh, whether abortion takes place in one race or another is irrelevant. Abortion is abortion. So there are certain political overtures here that have been added to the mix. Now, we never said that Roe versus Wade was joining of church and state. Well, if it came across like that, that is not what we meant. No. Now, let's just read this point. This is another comment that, that was made. I think the point Walter and Martin have made is not pro-abortion at all. But in view of that legislation should not be forged by the church's agenda regardless of the issue. If laws, laws are made in the name of religion, the papacy has an edge in demanding its absurdities. I think this person grasped more or less the essence of what we were trying to exactly. say. Exactly. We were talking about a bond of sympathy that is being created that will eventually lead to swallowing a hook with the tasty morsels. Yes. Right? Now, there was another one where the the viewer felt very strongly that we were totally on the wrong track. And then he went and listened very carefully again to what we said, and he wrote, I have reviewed this video, and I must change what I said originally. Now, he was obviously on the same wavelength level, more or less, as the previous speaker. Pastor Fight mentions and speaks between 44 and 40, what I think is trying to relay the trend that is happening, where we are moving along a theme of agreeing with the papal policies. He isn't saying that agreeing with them on the point of abortion in itself is uniting church and state. The dialogue is vague in a certain way, I think, and easily misunderstood at least for a poor slob like me who isn't very sharp on understanding things that maybe I should. Well, let me correct him there. He's doing very well. <laughs> That's what the message that he is saying that he now understands is exactly what we were trying to... Correct. That is what we were trying to say. Now, Martin, we don't have to read it all. I think the point is clear. There was room for misunderstanding. Now, are there many different varieties, in fact, the smorgasbord of sin available to humanity? Mm -hmm. Sin is sin, right? Mm. Sin leads to death. Uh, there are certain sins that are so heinous that y you cannot even contemplate them without becoming terribly disturbed in, in, in your nope. psyche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, is this something that we need to go into great detail or must we rather address the cause? That's it. Let me make it quite plain. Hmm. There are certain issues where there are no gray areas as far as I am concerned. And there are other issues where there might be gray areas. But overall... That doesn't mean that I favor something because there is a gray area. Mm. Now, let me make it clear, I'm not pro-abortion. No. In no sense of the fashion. But are there gray areas? Yes, if the mother's life is in danger, that is a gray area. Are there other gray areas? Well, we read about them all the time. And whether you take this view or that view, depends on your overall understanding of the issue. Now, I'm not going to go into that. No. We won't climb onto that soapbox. No. You see, that's exactly the thing. We don't go into the, that detail. 
That's why the articles that we showed were showing how ridiculous some of these things get. For instance, the postnatal or seven days or whatever that you can still abort after birth. I mean, obviously it, it we are... It gets totally ridiculous. Yeah. That's infanticide as far as I'm concerned. And what are the reasons why people are wanting to do abortions? Now, we're not going to have a discussion no. on abortion. That's not our soapbox. Uh, it falls into the broad character, character of rebellion against God. That's it. God is the author of life. He's not the author of death. God is not the author of confusion. Martin, let's take another issue. One that is very disturbing to me. And uh, we could make that our sub box if we wanted to. But even there, we won't. But let's just use it as an example. Namely, the issue of pedophilia. Pedophilia, where adults violate small children, to me, is one of the vilest crimes that humanity can commit. And if I had to choose a soapbox to stand on, I would stand on it. Because in my opinion, there are no gray areas in pedophilia. It is demonic. It is evil in every sense of the word. But humanity has reached the point where they are willing to excuse it and maybe in the future even embrace it. So let's just have a look at this little video, Minor Attracted Persons Follow the Dark Side of Truth. Scholars say pedophilia is now a sexual orientation that should be accepted by members of society. Most of us feel discomfort when we think about pedophiles. But just like pedophiles, we are not responsible for our feelings. We do not choose them. But we are responsible for our actions, and we must make a decision. It is in our responsibility to reflect and to overcome our negative feelings about pedophiles and to treat them with the same respect we treat other people with. We should accept that pedophiles are people who have not chosen their sexuality and who, unlike most of us, will never be able to live it out freely if they want to lead an upright life. We should accept that pedophilia is a sexual preference. We should accept that pedophilia is a sexual preference. Now, the Pope just visited Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there he attended a mass. And he also apologized for the sexual abuses of hundreds of children by the church. Mm. Now, by no means am I saying that this problem occurs only in the Catholic Church. No. It is a problem of humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, where do those thoughts and those ideas come from? From the devil. They come from Satan. Yeah. He plants those ideas into humanity. And you can act upon them or you can reject them decidedly. Does that only apply to pedophilia or does it apply to anything else? Anything else. Does it apply even to the attraction between a man and a woman? Yes. If there's an inappropriate thought in your mind, where does that thought come from who planted that thought in your mind? Yes, Satan did. And Satan did. Mm -hmm. And you have a choice whether you act upon it or whether you don't. Exactly. When it comes to Roman Catholicism, then we note that they, more than any other denomination, are plagued with this particular phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is because of their stance on celibacy that they are more avenues to the mind that are created. Nowhere in the Bible do we read that priests were celibate. On the contrary, if they weren't married, they couldn't be part of the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, all of these issues play a role. Sin is sin. If an idea of this nature pops into your mind, then you must deal with it as decidedly as you would deal with any other disease that crops up that's, in humanity. And that's true for all sin. For all sin. So are there any grades of pedophilia? The fact that you practice it in your mind but don't practice it um, on the outside, does that make it right? No, because if you put into context Jesus telling you that even if you think something bad against your brother, you commit murder. Yes, and if you look at another woman That's to it. lust after her, you have committed adultery. Mm. So, Martin, the issue that we're trying to address here is sin is a universal problem. Now, in my opinion, pedophilia is something that would really get me riled up. Mm. But I'm not going to make it a soapbox because it is just a symptom. Yep. It is a symptom of a greater problem. Yes. And if we don't address the greater problem, then we will constantly sit with the symptoms. That's it, the cause of the disease. The cause of the disease. So we need to discuss why we concentrate on the three angels' messages. And once again, just for clarity's sake, that's not meaning that we don't also strongly feel against all these other sins. Absolutely. As I said, I would, <laughs> I would happily make one or two of these issues my soapbox, but I have to war against it. Because where is the limit? Where do you draw the line? Mm. What about uh, racial indiscretion? I mean, there are parties. Let's take our country. Let's, let's have a, a little straightforward chat here. There are parties on both sides of the color line in this country of ours, South Africa, that feel highly offended about situations. And I can understand why from both mm. sides. Are we going to choose sides on the issue? No. No. Because again, they are symptoms of a greater problem. And us not choosing a side does not mean that we don't see any um, wrongdoing or that there are people hurting through it. Absolutely. We're just not getting into that. We ac accept that any racial form of um, racism is not from God. It's not from God. By one blood has he created the whole of humanity. I mean, the Bible is very clear on that issue. So let's take an extreme right-wing position and look at their list of grievances. Many of them are justified. Let's take an extreme left-wing view and look at their list of grievances. Many of them are justified. Are we going to choose a soapbox? No. no. Why are these grievances there? And why are these attitudes there that eventually lead to hatred? And hatred leads to aggression. And aggression leads to killing your brother. That's it. You see, if you get pulled in and get a soapbox to stand on, it's so much harder, and we'll get to that part, to do the love your neighbor part. Yes. So what is the solution to all of this? You have to transcend the soapbox. Yes. You have to climb above it. Mm. And if you don't, you will be swallowed in by one ideology or another. How easy is it to sway virtually an entire nation into a particular direction. Well, this is the plan been through the ages. This is and has it worked? Yes, it yes. has worked. What what about <laughs> the Nazi regime? Whole nation. Okay. Is Nazism dead? No. No, it's alive and well in many factions. Communism? What about communism? 
It's the same thing. They both march exactly the same way to bring about a uniformitarian mindset. The burial of individualism. Okay, so we want to address the issue of why the problem is there in the first place. Now, when you go back to the Garden of Eden, it was a very minor thing that Eve partook of a fruit. But look at the consequences. That's exactly. All of these issues that we have today, right? Why did she partake of the fruit? Because she didn't follow the true authority. She gave in to want something more than she thought God gave. Who planted that idea in her mind? The adversary. The adversary. And what she acted upon was a distrust and an unbelief in what God had said. That was the issue. That was the issue. So the taking of the fruit was just a consequence of a train of thought that negated what God had said. Isn't that right? Okay. So let's look at the essence of the three angels' messages and let's go and fetch it right there in the beginning. If we go to the book of Deuteronomy, we read in many, many places. We've just taken some of the verses here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. All right. It is a commandment. You shall love the Lord your God. You know, Martin, if I went up to the girl I fancied and I said to her, you shall love me, mm -hmm. that'll work like a charm, eh? <laughs> uh, you might have a robot loving you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd run into all kinds of problems. Now, when I was an atheist, this riled me. Mm -hmm. Because after all, who was God, in my opinion then, in case someone misunderstands me again, <laughs> To command love. You can't command love. And why should he command love to such an extent that it was to be above any other love? Yeah. Some people might say this is legalism. Yes, all right. So, God, why would you say you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might? You shall love him. Now, firstly, we have to understand what love is. That's a very important part of the, the command. Maybe there's a misconception about what love is, right? I think definitely. I think so too. All right. Why is it of paramount importance to God that you should love him? It's a very important question. Because it could be because God is a selfish individual who wants it all for himself. Mm. Or there could be a much higher motive that I in my fallen state cannot even comprehend. Yeah. Hmm? I've had to make that mind switch in my life. All right, if we go to chapter 11, verse 1, we see something added here. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgment and his commandments always. Are the commandments and obedience to God linked to love? Yes. It's inseparable. You cannot separate them, right? No. All right. So the charge, what God has said, the statutes, the judgments, the commandments are linked to love. You cannot take them away. So is God then a control freak? Because you have to do these things and you have to love him. No, if that's your thought, then modify it. It's wrong. You're misunderstanding God. You're misunderstanding God. All right. So you shall love the Lord your God and you shall keep everything that he said. Let's go a little further. Verse 22. 
And if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. It's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. All right, so you must diligently keep how many of the commandments? All of them. All of them. Mm -hmm. And then you must love the Lord your God, and you must walk in all of his ways, and you must cleave unto him. Is God being selfish? No. And if that's your thought, change it. Change it. You need to understand God. You need to understand love. You need to understand why the commandments and the judgments and the statutes and the charge are linked inseparably from the love of God. You need to understand that if you don't, you're going to have to get a soapbox. That's right? the problem. Yeah. And you could have a soapbox where God is your pet hate. Exactly. I had that soapbox. Hmm? I hated God with a passion. He was the one, don't do what I say and I throw you in hell for all eternity. Huh? Hmm. Hmm. That was the God that I looked upon in the past. And my soapbox disintegrated. It melted. It's gone. I, I don't have one to stand on anymore. I was 100% wrong in my estimation. Hmm. Let's go to chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. That's a powerful one. All right. Now let's see what's attached to love the Lord your God. God will change your heart. Yeah. Can you see why this is the essence? It's not the issues that we are talking about. It's the lack of something. Mm. It's the lack of relationship with God that brings about the possibility for all of these issues, no matter how vile or insignificant they might be. Absolutely. I was listening to a sermon by one of our pastors, and he was saying that the Ten Commandments... It's part of the covenant. That's why it's in the Ark of the Covenant. If you take the Ten Commandments, the tablets, out of the Ark of the Covenant, then you've only got the commandments, but you don't have a relationship. Then it's legalism. That's when you start climbing onto so boxes. All right. Now, if you take the commandments out, Martin, do they still then have a mercy seat covering them? No. So if you've taken them out of the Ark, then they can actually lead to death. Exactly. Huh? Because you're not being covered by but, the mercy seat. And everything is just jointed then. Could you perhaps modify those Ten Commandments to suit yourself? Mm -hmm. Are there churches that have done that? That's it. Both Catholic originally and Protestant subsequently? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's just... Unpack this a, a little bit more. God will change your heart. That's what it promises here. He'll change your heart to love the Lord your God. Hmm? And why is that essential? So that you may live. Yeah. If you don't have this combination, you're going to what? You're die. going to die. You're going to die. So one, is it essential that we get this right? Yes. It's a relationship. Okay. Can I force love? Can, no, can you? Can I force obedience to the commandments? You can force it, but it will disjoin the relationship. Yes. So it will not work. No. Therefore, can I legislate commandments? Now, the one comment was yes, I can. The state has the duty to legislate commandments, like do not murder, for example. Uh, can the state legislate the mind? No. So if I hate my brother, I've already committed murder. So the state has a very limited scope in which it can legislate. Exactly. And there are certain other issues that it cannot legislate at all. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't legislate. And if they legislate, say, something like Roe versus Wade, etc., 
then that doesn't mean that I'm anti the legislation. I'm anti the sin. That's it. Okay. And it's leading to, to a fulfillment of prophecy. Yes. All right, we have to unpack this. So we have to know what it means when it says, love the Lord your God. Love is a, a very complicated word, and we will have to talk about that. And you have to do it with all your heart. And if you don't, you won't live. Now, Psalms 97 verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. So something happens in the mind that when you love God, then automatically you start hating evil. Mm -hmm. All evil. All evil, no matter what kind of evil. Even a look can be evil. Yeah. And before you might not have recognized it, but the demeanor of a person, the look in the eyes, yeah. will tell you, is that, a, is that the look of someone who has recognized the righteousness of Christ? Or is that a look that has a dark shadow? Mm. Okay. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. That's a beautiful promise. So if you love the Lord, then you will hate evil. But if you, at any level, go against evil, you will have peer pressure applied to you to commit evil. Yeah. School children, are they constantly, constantly bombarded with peer pressure? Yeah. If they're taking drugs, don't they want everybody to take drugs? Nobody wants to sin alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, yeah. No. Uh, when it comes to perversions. It has to have a buddy. They have to have a buddy. They have competitions to see how perverse they can become. But if you love God, then you will hate evil. And he will preserve your soul. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked. He'll give you a way of escape. Doesn't mean you won't be bombarded. Proverbs 8 verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Ah. Is this perhaps a synonym? The fear of the Lord leads you to hate evil. The love of the Lord leads you to hate evil. That's it. Now, what does it mean, the fear of the Lord? The respect of respect. the Respect. Respect God for what he is. So when you respect God, you will hate evil. You will hate pride. You will hate arrogancy. Mm -hmm. You will hate every evil way. You will hate every forward mouth. Because God hates it. Yeah. It becomes, it becomes abhorrent to you, mm -hmm. right? All of it, all these evil. Okay. Now, some people believe that if you're living in an evil age, you have to isolate yourself from this evil. Enoch walked amidst the evil, mm -hmm. and yet he wasn't contaminated by the evil because evil had become abhorrent to him. Yeah. That's the point we have to arrive at. Now, Again, we're not going to identify every form of evil. We're not going to make it a soapbox because this is the essence of the matter. This is why it even has a foothold. Because the first commandment, to love God, has been neglected. So let's go to what Jesus said. Matthew 22. Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. He's quoting Deuteronomy, right? That's it. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, Love God, love your neighbor, summarizes the law of God. That's it. That's what it says, right? But he says the first one, and the great commandment is to love God. 
But then he says the second one is like it. But it's still the second one. The second one. Because you cannot do the second one if you do not have the first one. Exactly. It's not a true... The definition of love gets lost if you don't do the first one. You have to have the first one because God is the one who enables you to have the second one. All right, so there were two tables of stone. And love for God is summarized on the first one. Is that under attack in the world? <laughs> Definitely. All right, we've had lecture and lecture and lecture yeah. upon it. So the authority of God is it set aside in the world. Mm -hmm. And this is a great evil. Because once you set aside the authority of God, you're listening to the serpent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The serpent said, did God really say? The serpent said, it will surely not be like that. It will be the other way. So believing the serpent led to the misery that we have. Did it lead to promiscuity? Yes. Did promiscuity lead to abortion? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> right? So you can trace all sin. All sin come from this base. Please don't misunderstand us again, but this is the issue. Why we concentrate on the three angels' message. We have to say why. Mm. You know, we talk a lot about the Sabbath. Yeah. Now, some people will say, now, how can you possibly say that whether you go to church on a Sunday or a Saturday is even remotely comparable to the issue of abortion or pedophilia? Well, we will see why. Exactly. <laughs> I won't, will I won't jump the gun. <laughs> so let's not jump the gun. All right, so on these two hang the law and the prophets. Jesus qualifies, he goes even further. Matthew 10, verse 37, he says, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. My goodness, I would say, that is the most selfish statement that you could possibly read from any individual. If you don't love me more <laughs> than you love your own wife or your own child, you're damned. Mm. But what if we turn it around? Yeah, just to turn it around. Let's just turn it around. If you don't love me more than your father and your mother, eventually you're going to go down the slippery slope of sin. Now, if you turn it around and you say, if you love me, you will love your mother and your father and your brother. And you will be able to love them no matter what they whisper in your ear. Right? That's it. But you will be able to discern what is right and what is wrong because God will give you the capacity. It is paramount that you put God first so that you can love your father, so that you can love your mother, so that you can love your son, so that you can love your daughter, even if mm -hmm. they go astray. That's it. The true meaning of love will come through if you do the first part in loving God. You can interpret any one of these by coming to the conclusion that God is the most selfish being in the universe. Or you, if you study it through, might come to the conclusion, or hopefully will come to the conclusion, that if you don't put God first, then you are going to be doomed to sit with the consequences of sin. So John 14 verse 15 says, If you love me, then you will keep my commandments. And if you say that you know him and you keep not his commandments, then you are a liar and the truth is not in you. We've used these verses many times. But this is how deceiving sin is. If you don't love God, you cannot keep the commandments. You might have rules that you enforce, but you cannot keep them. Because if you love God, even your mind yes. will be guarded. Exactly, because like you've mentioned before, you can have rules that say don't murder, but your mind can still do it. Yes. Now, 
We're not going to go into grey areas because we don't choose soapboxes. But take any, any activity that deviates from God's original plan. Any activity that deviates from God's original plan and try to excuse it by saying, I was born this way. Or I cannot help the way I think is highly problematic. If you make God first, then all things can come back into harmony with his principles. That's a very important statement. When you do it, it will come back in harmony. Okay. Now let's go back even further. Why has God got the right to tell us these things? Let's see. So, I've titled it here, The Lord's Claim. Isaiah 45, verse 18, And thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. By the way, is that part of the first angel's message? Yes. Very much so, right? Worship him who? Made. made. Mm -hmm. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. This is a very powerful statement. It is. And you asked the question earlier, why would the Sabbath be more important than abortion? Hmm. Let's, let's <laughs> just go into it. Don't jump the gun, Martin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're an impatient <laughs> fellow here today. <laughs> and rein myself in. Rain our, let's rein ourselves in. All right. What's very important in here is he's the creator God. He's your creator. Now, Martin, when I, when I see this creation thing, <laughs> Val Nahari comes to mind, the advisor to Klaus Schwab, who says that we're even greater than God because we can now create life, and not only organic life, but we can create electronic life, you know, artificial intelligence. We're even greater than God. I, I, I shudder when I think of the patheticness of it. Mm -hmm. Organic life is so complex that only God himself could put that together. And then... When we talk about AI and all of these things, what are they using? They're using what's already there, the forces of nature. Who put those forces into nature? God, he's laughing at their ridiculous statements. But let me not go there because else I'll climb on a soapbox so and get all angry and Twitter and busted. <laughs> you see, I'm glad you're not on a soapbox because you wouldn't have ever gotten off your creation uh, no, evolution. I would have been one. on the creation no. soapbox forever. Just, no, it's not. It's a worthy soapbox. It is. I'm not arguing against the no, worthiness thereof. But it's encompassing. It's the whole truth. And it's not as if people didn't try to keep you on that box as well. Yes, there were many attempts to keep me on one box. Don't go into this three angels message business. But if we don't, we miss the point. All right, so why did he create it? He didn't create it in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there's none else. I'm your creator, God. I created this world. I created it not for nothing, to be inhabited. By whom? By you and me. Uh -huh. So what does he want? He wants a relationship. That's it. He wants a relationship. On whose terms? His terms. His terms. Yeah. Why? Has he got the right to say that? He, he's got the right <laughs> and he knows best. <laughs> All right, so he obviously thought this thing through, yeah. right? Now, if you look at nature and you see the beauty of nature and you see the interplay that we have in nature and, you know, the codependence that we have in nature and the, just the f finesse and the beauty and the magnificence of it, what does that tell you about God? He knows best. He knows best, all right? So he created it to be inhabited. And he laid the groundwork mm. and set the rules as to how it shall be. You don't like it. You don't want it. You're free to opt out. 
then you're gone. And then you have to live with the consequences. Which is Death. oblivion. Is it? Okay. Jeremiah 31 verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. All right. God doesn't only command that we love him. He tells us that he loves us. Yeah. And that he will establish that you can love him. So it's a very reciprocal relationship. So he created us for a reason. He wanted the earth to be inhabited, not as a PlayStation, but as a relationship. And this relationship is love. Okay, we have to define that. Now, eternal life, therefore, is conditional. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Bottom line, the Lord's claim. I created the earth. I created all things. I created you. I wanted you. I want to have a relationship with you. I love you. But there are certain things that you have to do in order to qualify for eternal life within this realm. To make this relationship work. Okay. And if you don't like it, then you can go back to where you were, oblivion. Mm -hmm. That's the Lord's claim. Yeah. Take it or leave. leave it. Now, God could be a monster and you might want to leave it. But God could actually be the most magnificent, the most wonderful, the most loving, the most compassionate being in the entire universe and your joy is just unspeakable if you embrace it. Why would you want to give it up then? Huh? That's you, only if you listen to a false adversary. All right. Now, how do you acknowledge the Lord's claim? So the Lord makes a claim mm -hmm. and he says, this is, this is the status quo. I have created you. I've given you a beautiful home. I want a relationship with you. That relationship has to be built on trust, mm -hmm. respect, and love. And here are the rules. Okay? Let's go. Acknowledging the Lord's claim. Isaiah 56, verse 6. Also, the sons of the strangers. He's talking to the Jewish nation. That join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord. To be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. This is fascinating. So all people must get to know this God yeah. and they must join themselves to God. And when they do that, they must love the name of the Lord. Now previously it says you must love God. Now it says you must love the name of the Lord. That's his character. character. Mm -hmm. So you must make a study of the character of God and then you must decide, I want this. Mm. You must love the character of God. And then you want to be his servant. And Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you brothers and sisters. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Okay. Everyone, what's this here, Martin? <laughs> Why does he drop the Sabbath into it? Because that's his relationship mark. <laughs> All right. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. Now, the covenant is a legal document. Yeah. It's a, a document where two parties decide to keep to a particular regime. Mm -hmm. Right? And God has made it quite plain. I'm your creator. Here are the rules. <laughs> this is where you're going to live. We're going to have a relationship. And if you don't like it, you can opt out. Yeah. You can choose. Here are the conditions for staying within the covenant. Mm -hmm. Here are the conditions for excluding yourself from the covenant. You may choose. Is that unfair as the creator? No. 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 It's his right. It's his right. He, he established it and he wants 
the, and the whole time, he initiates this. Okay. Now, why does he link it to the Sabbath? What has the Sabbath, mm. Martin, got to do with your decision to come into a covenant relationship and a love relationship with God? Can I answer it? You're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Acknowledgement that he is the one that you want to be in a relationship with. Ah, so he's made the Sabbath a sign. That's it. Ezekiel, that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. In other words, I am the Lord that helps you in your mind to hate evil. That's it. Hmm? And by keeping the Sabbath, I will establish that. And the Sabbath is the sign that you have accepted the authority of God. Because we just read that he created the heavens, the earth, the sea, the springs of water. Was that in the first angel's message? Yes. Is it in the Sabbath commandment? Yes. Ah, it's the same. So can you separate the Sabbath commandment from the first angel's message? No. You know what? You cannot not keep the Sabbath if you love God. All right. Now, Martin, if you're keeping the Sabbath now, is it now an issue of, is it a Wednesday or Thursday or Sunday or a Monday no. or a Saturday? No. But God said the seventh day is the Sabbath. If you say yes to that, you are saying, your authority is paramount to me. I will accept it. The serpent climbs into the tree and says, I've changed it to Sunday. Mm. Come and keep mine and I will sanctify you. I will give you ceremonies. I will give you sacraments. And I will ensure that you get eternal life. Mm. Then what must I say? No, thank you. No, thank you. Because your command is contrary to God's command. You're telling me I must follow your authority and acknowledge it by keeping the first day of the week when God said I must follow his authority and acknowledge it by keeping the seventh day of the week. So I am accepting God's authority when I keep the Sabbath. It's not rocket science. And he says, I'm the Lord that sanctifies you. Then he tells me, you know, if you, if you have accepted this, if you've joined yourself to the Lord to love my character, and you're keeping the Sabbath as an external sign that you have actually done this, then I will teach you to hate sin. That's it. So if you're keeping the Sabbath in order to be saved, You've missed the point. Maybe I must then clarify just for in case somebody misunderstood me earlier. When I said it's impossible to love God without keeping the Sabbath. It must be the right sequence. If you want to keep the Sabbath to be saved, that won't work. Won't work. The won't relationship work. comes first. Relationship. And what about people that don't know this? We've spoken about that numerous Time times. Time of ignorance, God winks at us. Let's not go there. Not but there. this is the issue. You cannot divorce the Sabbath because it is the sign of his authority. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever for the stranger that joins themselves to this faith. Isaiah 56 verse 7. Even them, in other words, these strangers, that's you and me, Martin, Will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer? Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will, shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel said, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. It is universal. It applies to the whole of humanity irrespective of where you come from. The Sabbath is the issue of authority. Now, Martin, we also need to clarify what is love. Because Doesn't, people don't have a concept of what is love. I thought Hollywood did a good job. Didn't mm, it? Yes, they're <laughs> doing a good job at giving the other side of what love is, leading you into sin. In fact, the best thing that could happen to that box is for a millstone to be tied to its neck and thrown into the sea. And uh, sin should become exceedingly sinful.
Now, what is love? You know, Peter had to learn what love is. Mm. Do you love me yeah. more than these? After he had denied him three times, not I, Lord, I will go through the ends of the earth. I will never leave you. And then Jesus came to him and he said, Do you love me? Agapeo. And Peter answered, You know that I phileo you. Peter, do you agapeo me more than these? You know, Lord, that I phileo you. And the third time, Peter, do you phileo me? And then he was exceedingly sad. The Lord took a step down because Peter had demonstrated that he wasn't capable of unselfish love. Now, the Greeks didn't regard agapeo as the highest form of love. Eros was the highest form of love. It's not mentioned in the Bible once. It doesn't belong there. Mm. It's that passionate yeah. love between a man and a woman. These days you would rephrase that, but I'm not going to go to that soapbox. <laughs> So the bottom line is, Peter realized that he didn't have this love. He never knew what it was until it failed him, the love that he had. Mm. It failed him because he didn't have that love. But he had to get to that love. Yes, that's why later on when you read about Peter's experiences and how he deals with it, he mentions his ladder, mm. the ladder that you climb. You have to add to your faith virtue. And then he gives this long list and he ends with agapeo. So in other words, he knows where we have to go to. Now that's something that is so divine that we cannot attain it. Only God can give it to you. Like he mentioned in the verses before, he does that work inside. Correct. So what is love, Martin? Let's read a few things in the statements of the Spirit of Prophecy. The love of Christ is not a fitful feeling, but a living principle which is to be made manifest as an abiding power in the heart. If the character and deportment of the shepherd is an exemplification of the truth he advocates, the Lord will set the seal of his approval to the work. The shepherd and the flock will become one, united by their common hope in Christ. So Martin, love is not a feeling, it is a principle. Mm. And once this principle is enacted, there can be unity. Do we have unity at the moment? No. You're so adamant. What's wrong <laughs> Sorry, with you? But <laughs> if we don't would, have unity. No, right? because if there was unity, the job would get done. The job would get done. We would stop shouting at each other, running each other down. Mm. We would be on the wall with the sword in the one hand and the trowel in the other hand, and we would be building the wall. There's a breach in the wall. Exactly. Get off the soapbox. Get on the ladder up to the wall. Get onto the wall. There is a bigger principle that is at stake here. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found. We love him because he first loved us. In the heart renewed by divine grace, love is the ruling principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, ennobles the affections. This love cherished in the soul sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around. Martin, is this love Bounding in our church? Not yet. Not yet, right? No. 
Let's go on. True love is a high and holy principle, altogether different in character from that love which is awakened by impulse and which suddenly dies when severely tested. Love is a plant of heavenly growth. It must be fostered and nourished. Affectionate hearts, truthful, loving words will make happy families and exert an elevating influence upon all who come within the sphere of their influence. Martin, if we were to concentrate on this, mm -hmm. there would be such a change. I love that word, elevating influence. It will get you out of this nonsense and a little bit higher. If we swim in the cesspool, lamenting the cesspool, how can we get to this level? You cannot. You cannot. So the relationship and the trust that you have in God, the respect that you have for God, the respect for His divinity, the respect for His capacity as Creator God, the respect for His rules of life, which are so absolutely logical, that is the issue at stake. Mm -hmm. So the first angel's message says, worship God and give glory to him. Because there is a judgment coming. It's, it's already ongoing. It's already ongoing. And the second angel's message says, Babylon has fallen. Yeah. Why? Because they've made their own rules. Because they didn't do... They didn't do as God said. They took those commandments out of the ark. They're not covered by a murti seed. Some of them threw the commandments in the waste paper basket and don't even have commandments. So what do they need a mercy seed for? Mm. This is so ridiculous. If you set God aside, you have the terrible situation in the world, which we all lament at every single level whether it is the issue of abortion, whether it is the issue of pedophily, whether it is the issue of racial divide, whether it is the issue of uh, gender, yeah. whether it is bashing of other genders, either a man bashing a woman or a woman bashing a man or disrespect for the human body, all of these issues. Even if it's the issue of showing out the people in leadership. Yes. Now, does this mean, Martin, that you may never address sins? No. Of course you must address them. But if you neglect the cause, mm. you're always going to sit with the issue. So, true love versus passion. We might as well rephrase this, true love versus Hollywood. That's it. Well put. <laughs> Love is not unreasonable. It is not blind. It is pure and holy. Do you know, I could add something there that is highly biblical. It covers a multitude of sins. Hmm. If I were to concentrate on the transgressions of everybody around me, I would be the most domineering high-minded, pharisaical individual on the planet. If I have God's love, then I will have compassion for the weakness. Not excusing it. No, no. No. Because remember when, when God said to Moses, I will let my glory pass by you? And he said, the Lord, gracious, and all of those wonderful adjectives, by no means excusing the guilty. Mm -hmm. We cannot separate justice and mercy. But I would have compassion. And sometimes the Lord allowed in our lives situations so that we cannot say we are better than others because we probably even did worse than they did. So, it you know, I always use the example somebody walks into the church there are more nose rings and lip rings and who knows what rings in that person. Tattoos from the top to the bottom. And you say, what is that individual doing in my church? Mm. That person is coming into the church because there's a cry for help. 
right? Somebody once came up to me and said, uh, so are you going to condemn me because my whole body is covered with tattoos? And I said to him, you know, some people carry their scars on the inside and some people carry them on the outside, but we all have scars. So how do we treat people? How do we interact with one another? Do we go on a bandwagon and start calling people liars because they don't see something exactly like we see it? Or they don't voice their opinion as forcefully as you? Yes. So let's say, Martin, I had to deal with someone who has committed an abortion. And uh, what will be my attitude towards that individual? How do I deal with that individual? I have to ask myself the question before I do it. How would God do it? Exactly, because if you put yourself in this scenario, that person walks into the church, and you are standing on your soapbox screaming the whole time of how, how wrong it is, how, can you, how are you going to help this person? Yes. Now, I know someone in our family that totally withdrew from society for her entire life. Because when she was young, and uh, it was many years ago, so the issue was you know, still far more stringent than it is today, uh, had an abortion because she was so afraid of what her parents would say or her father would say if uh, it was found out that she had a relationship before she was married. And uh, when the abortion was done, it was twins. She never forgave herself. Never, ever forgave herself. And went to the grave that way. Mm. Now, if we had the love of God, we could, we could work through that. And if that person could then look at God and accept the love of God and the forgiveness of God, then one might be able to deal with some of these issues. You know, some people uh, carry their sins with them even if they confess them. It's like digging up the dog that's been buried over and over again, lamenting the fact that the dog has been buried. Mm. Once you have confessed your sins and forsaken your sins, don't dwell on them. No, don't take it back from God. Don't take it back. He's forgiven it as far as the east is from the west. And don't give Satan the pleasure of distrusting God in terms of his forgiveness. Mm. But let's not go there. We could have a long discussion. So love is not unreasonable, it's not blind, it is pure and holy. But the passion of the natural heart is another thing altogether. While pure love will take God into all its plans and will be in perfect harmony with the Spirit of God, passion will be headstrong, rash, unreasonable, defiant of all restraint, and will make the object of its choice an idol. In all the deportment of one who possesses true love, the grace of God will be shown. Modesty, simplicity, sincerity, morality, and religion will be characterized every step towards an alliance in marriage. Mm. Those who are thus controlled will not be absorbed in each other's society at a loss of interest in the prayer meeting and the religious service. Their fervor for the truth will not die on account of the neglect of the opportunities and privileges that God has graciously given to them. Martin, if you have true love for God, you must have true love for your brethren. With their mistakes. Does God love you even though you have mistakes? You've become faultless now, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're not faultless. You Anything. have your quirks. Oh, yes. You have someone to remind you of them? <laughs> I think God yes. graciously gave us those who remind us of our quirks. So, and it's so easy to start focusing on other people's quirks yes. that you don't see your own. So if occasionally you have to be forcefully reminded of your quirks so that you can learn compassion for other people's mm -hmm. quirks. 
And you know, you might have overcome one thing, but are battling with another. And the other person might have the reverse. And you will condemn that person. Mm. No, we must not constantly rule. be compassionate. That love, which has no better foundation than mere sensual gratification, will be headstrong, blind, and uncontrollable. Is that what we see in the world? Yeah. Why? Because they've neglected the first, love for God. Yeah, the first command. The, the, that essence. Honor, truth, and every noble elevated power of the mind are brought under the slavery of passion. The man who is bound in the chains of this infatuation is too often deaf to the voice of reason and conscience. Neither argument nor entreaty can lead him to see the folly of his course. Is society making excuses for sin? Yeah. Once it has made excuses for sin, will it go so far as to legislate it? Yes. Martin, where are we going? Yeah. Three angels' messages. Worship God. Fear God. Respect Him. Because He's the Creator, there's a judgment coming. Don't go the way of Babylon. Don't go the way of Babylon. Because Babylon is going to compromise with sin. It's going to redefine sin. Mm -hmm. It's going to tell you sin is separation from God. No, sin caused separation yeah. from God. Don't go along. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And she's pouring out wine, false doctrine. And don't accept the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is the opposite of of the mark of God, the seal of God. And that's found in the first angel already. That's found in the first angel and it's in the Sabbath Six. commandment. Yeah. That is the seal. I am the Lord your God, therefore I commanded you to keep holy the Sabbath day. It is the seal of God. And the mark of the beast is the contrary thereof. It is Sunday keeping. Because it says don't follow God, don't trust him to bring you salvation. I will give it to you my way. And that's the choice. And if you don't make the right choice there, all the rest. It's worth nothing. Worth nothing, yeah. So true love is not a strong, fiery, impetuous passion. On the contrary, it is calm and deep in its nature. It looks beyond mere externals and is attracted by qualities alone. It is wise and discriminating in its devotion, is real and abiding. Love lifted out of the realm of passion and impulse becomes spiritualized and is revealed in words and acts. A Christian must have a sanctified tenderness and love in which there is no impatience or fretfulness. The rude, harsh manners must be softened by the grace of Christ. Have you listened to some political debates lately? Martin, are they rude, harsh-mannered, fretful, impatient? I think the majority of humanity has become. So that. where's the essence of the problem? The love for God. The love for God. Sentimentalism is to be shunned as leprosy. Imagination, lovesick sentimentalism, should be guarded against as would be the leprosy. There goes all Hollywood productions. Very many of the young men and women in this age of the world are lacking in virtue. Therefore, great caution is needed. Those who have preserved a virtuous character, although they may lack in other desirable qualities, may be of real moral worth. And you cannot have it if you do not make God first. Nothing. It's the first and greatest commandment. And it is the essence of the three angels' messages. And that is also why when you preach the commandments, and you cannot, we've seen, you cannot separate it from the love of God because it is character. That's why when you understand that, how can people tell you you must preach the love of Christ but not this legalism. It's, it's totally distorted. Let's just go to the second tablet. Because it's like unto the first, right? 
So the claims of the second great commandment. Leviticus 19.17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. This almost looks contradictory. So you may not hate your brother, but you may tell him what is right and what is wrong when he's doing something specifically wrong. But you may not hate him. 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. How can, how can God say that? Because you've neglected the first commandment, you're incapable of this one. Yeah, And neglecting the first leads to death. Leads to death. And the only one who can change this mind of yours is God. And give you this compassion is God himself. 1 John 4 verse 20, If a man say, I love God, and he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Martin, is it possible to love your brother and not like him? Yes. Yes, it is quite possible to not like someone. Now, but why is it that there are certain people that you don't like? What is it that makes you not like them? The, Their mannerisms, yeah. whatever they do. Now, that which they do <laughs> comes from what? <laughs> what they believe. All right. So if you find someone that is not likable, that should spurn you to greater love. Mm. Now, greater love had no one than he who laid down his life while you were yet a sinner. So the fact that you don't like him should instill in you feelings of love. Now, God has given us families. He's given us children. It's very easy not to like what some of your children are doing. And then, if they are very stubborn in this, it is maybe possible to not even like them anymore. Mm. But can that negate love? No. No, it cannot, right? It cannot. 1 John 4.21, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. It's... It's a given. The example of this, I just think again of Jesus hanging on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All right. Now, now that we've had all of these verses, as you have said, they know not what they do. Let's jump to the first one again. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You may say what is wrong, mm. what they are doing wrong, but you may not condemn your brother. Mm. You must love him. Okay. So how do we address the brethren in the church? Martin, it has become a habit to bash people within the church. And uh, it's something that sometimes one feels inclined to do. <laughs> but you have to fight the impulse. Right? Yes. So here is a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy that hopefully will wrap this thing up. Shall we go for it? Let's go for it. <laughs> Let's go for it. You will have many perplexities to meet in your Christian life in connection with the church. You know, Paul had a long list of, <laughs> of things that happened to him. He was stoned. He was, you know, the list is endless. He was in the deep. He was washed away from this shore. Shipwrecked. He, he was shipwrecked. He was beaten up. You know, he had a long list. And he ends up with, oh, the brethren. <laughs> they the cherry on top. Now, in my life, I've had a long list with the brethren. And there were occasions when my feelings were unkind, to say the least, or my thoughts. 
And it took some serious introspection and some serious prayer sometimes to get them sorted out again. I'm not saying it's perfect, no. but I'm working at it. It's a work in progress. All right, so especially perplexities that we will meet in the church. And then the statement, but do not try too hard to mold your brethren. If you see that they do not meet the requirements of God's word, do not condemn. If they provoke, do not retaliate. When things are said that would exacerbate, quietly keep your soul from fretting. You must labor for the erring with a heart subdued, softened by the Spirit of God, and let the Lord work through you the agent. Roll your burden on Jesus. You feel that the Lord must take up the case where Satan is striving for the mastery over some soul. But you are to do what you can in humility and meekness and put the tangled work, the complicated matters, into the hands of God. Follow the direction in his word and leave the outcome of the matter to his wisdom. Having done all you can to save your brother, cease worrying and go calmly about your other pressing duties. It is no longer your matter, but God's. Let's make it quite plain. Mm -hmm. We've made a decision to be on the wall. That's it. To bring the three angels' messages, because if you get that right, the rest will come right by itself. Because God will take care of it. Yes, I can address sin. But I may not be harsh to my brother. Do not, through impatience, cut the knot of difficulty, making matters hopeless. Let God untangle the snarled up threads for you. He is wise enough to manage the complications of our lives. He has skill and tact. We cannot always see his plans. We must wait patiently their unfolding and not mar and destroy them. He will reveal them to us in his own good time. Seek for unity. Cultivate love and conformity to Christ in all things. He is the source of unity and strength. If you do as God would have you, his blessing will come into the church. May I appeal to all the brethren out there. We are all fighting a war against evil. But the ultimate answer is to make God first. Yeah. That's what the three angels' messages are all about. Give God the glory. He is the creator. He has given you a sign. Do not follow Babylon and do not follow a false seal of approval. Stick to what God has said and he will Join you to him as you want to be joined to him. Mm. And he will change your mind. So with that in mind, let us wrap up this subject and leave it to God and pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, sin is raging like a fire out of control. And the only solution is for humanity to turn to God with every fiber of their being, to trust the Lord their God, to believe in the Lord their God, and to implement his will and join with him in a solemn covenant. Help us to achieve this through the messages of the three angels is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.